everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you out there for watching on the internet. This is David Wilcock. That's me. We're talking about my new book, Synchronicity Key, which is a monumental effort of scholarship. It's got over 700 references in it. Actually, not quite 700. It's 680 something. But uh, what we're dealing with here is a comprehensive examination of history and the idea that history is not random. The events that are happening in our reality are scripted and structured intelligently. And this goes back to what I was discussing in my previous book, it's now available in paperback, the source field investigations discussed the idea that we are in a living cosmos, that the universe itself is alive. And so when we think about a concept like that, it fundamentally changes the basic nature of what it means to be human, what it means to be alive. So being human is a galactic phenomenon, and I've been talking a lot about that on my new show on Gaim TV called Wisdom Teachings. Half an hour a week, every week we got a new episode coming out with all kinds of amazing content. The living universe is the idea that mind created the universe, that that's all there is, and that mind has given us life as part of a greater ground state of being. In other words, life is not some random accident that happened only on Earth. Life is a phenomenon that is universal in nature. Organic life is going to appear all throughout the cosmos, anywhere and everywhere that it can. And we are, in fact, divine manifestations. Life did not happen as some random happenstance here on Earth. It has been sent here from cosmic dust that's created from stars. The stars themselves are creating dust that has been tested as bacteria. That's one of the points I mention a lot in the television show and in the new book. So as we are going through these cycles of evolution, we come back to an intrinsic core point, which is that the universe has an agenda. The universe is not just here to let us figure it out on our own. There is a very intelligent structure caused by a super intelligence, actually, that is governing how we evolve here on Earth. In other words, the events that actually happen, the historical events, the wars, the political conspiracies, the conflicts, all the stuff that involves, in many cases, loss of life, those events are not random. There is a structure to history, there is a structure to the events that are happening in our reality, and we are infused by this greater cosmic consciousness. It is fundamentally one with us. The universe ultimately is only identity. It is only awareness. That's all there is. And this idea of a physical universe is a holographic projection of this greater intrinsic consciousness that gave rise to what we now call existence. So with this knowledge comes the opportunity for us to step out of the cycle of war. We don't have to keep repeating the same problems, the same failures. We can start geoengineering entire planets. Some of these moons that might be out there in our own solar system may actually be hollow on the inside and inhabited by other humans like us. That's one of the things that I've heard from insiders who have worked in very high levels of classification secrecy within the United States government and other governments. Why are we not hearing more about this? Why is there a UFO cover-up? Could it be that the potential of the human being is so vast, once our pineal gland is activated, that's one of the big secrets, there is a functional third eye inside your brain. We've talked about that in previous videos. When we get to this pineal activation, is there going to be some sort of transfiguration of the earth and the way that things have been going on earth into a happier and more positive age. Now, yes, this is a woman with combat boots and fingerless gloves, and some people criticize me for using that picture in a recent article, but hey, I can resonate with this girl just fine. So that younger generation is coming in, and we're all feeling this change in our own way. Sometimes people want to dress up really funny and look different, because they don't like the way things are happening in the world. When I was in high school, I wore black t-shirts and I was very moody and somber and didn't want to talk to anybody. 
So don't necessarily assume that just because somebody looks like that, that that means that they're not a very active component of this planetary change is happening. So in many of my other works, including the previous book, we talk about the idea that the human being is a galactic emanation. DNA is a universal and galactic emanation. We're going to get into a little of that here in this talk. There is abundant, ample evidence that we have been visited by extraterrestrial gods. And now that it's almost August, I think it's safe for me to say that I've been filmed for a whole new round of Ancient Aliens episodes. I don't know how many exactly, but there's probably going to be a total of 15 or 16 episodes that I'm in on that show on History Channel. Now, their whole point is to talk about the idea that human-looking people that are not born on Earth visited the Earth for thousands of years, built megalithic architecture, meaning pyramids, Stonehenge, things like that, but one of the things that you don't usually hear about as much is that they also embedded certain important messages into mythology. So as we look at ancient myths, we find out that there is a unified worldwide message from these human extraterrestrials. Not a common term. People aren't used to hearing that. When I was on Ancient Aliens, they said, can't you just say extraterrestrials? I said, well, they're not just extraterrestrials because you've been brainwashed into thinking that extraterrestrials are these terrifying creatures, as people call them, not mothers, fathers, and children, not families like ours that just happen to not have been born on Earth. And if there are humans all over the galaxy, then what if the potential of being human goes way beyond what we're now seeing? What if the potential to be human includes becoming an energetic being? That does seem to be a very important part of the worldwide message that they gave in ancient mythology, we find that dozens of different mythologies around the world encoded the exact same information, and one of the really important data points on that, it comes from Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell did an incredible job of comparative mythology, and he worked on the shoulders of others like Adolf Bastian before him, who had combined different mythologies from around the world and found that they all have a hidden blueprint. Now, this is the way that the book cover looked when I got his uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. As you see down here on the bottom, you got Luke Skywalker. Well, George Lucas followed the Hero's Journey blueprint. There is a story blueprint that is written into ancient mythology. And what's so weird is that he shows in this book that it's the same story, the same sequence of events happening to the same main character all across the world. So many, many different people have chosen to diagram this as a circle, and there's a very good reason for that, because in many ancient cultures it's called the wheel of fortune or the wheel of karma. And these are the cycles of life. So we begin at the top of the cycle not knowing very much. You can see here that the first thing that happens to the hero is a call to adventure, then we have supernatural aid that comes in. There is a threshold guardian, i.e. an enemy, that in interrupts the call to adventure. Then as we go through the threshold, we move into the unknown world. This is a magical kingdom that we, that, that we now enter into. There is a threshold area. There are mentors and helpers that come to help us. Increasing challenges and temptations as we're trying to get our goal, our quest. This is all about a quest met. And then we hit this bottom point, the abyss, and it should very much be at the bottom of the wheel. This is the point called all is lost or the dark night of the soul, where it seems that there's no way out and there may actually be the risk of physical death, if not an actual death in the story. But through this process comes revelation and transformation. There is a facing off against the villain and this is a very important point. The villain in these stories represents the projection of the father. The father projection. We all seem to have issues with our parents growing up. And in this hero's story, the father represents the negative, the adversary, but it also represents your ego, the part of you that is uninformed by cosmic intelligence and wisdom. So you face off against the father figure, you go through this revelation, you understand how to move through that challenge, 
and vanquish the nemesis, but then there's an atonement with the Father, a, a sort of apology and forgiveness. Then you eventually cross back into the known world, and then you have to return to the world you came from. And from that return, you now transform the world for the better. So this is a cycle, and it keeps on happening in ancient mythologies. But more importantly, I will argue that this is a universal, but more importantly, galactic blueprint. This is a basic design of a sequence of events that will happen in people's lives for any inhabited world in our entire galaxy. It's going to be the same sequence. So there's a lot of different slides that I was able to find that show the similar types of story points. Some of them have more than others. This person, for example, talked about the hero's journey as a transformation cycle of moving from grief, anger, denial, sadness, despair, letting go, going through the void, that feeling of total emptiness, the breakthrough, then feelings of wonder, imagination, vision, empowerment, action, back to order once more. And the cycle thus completes itself. This is a very detailed diagram that I found online of the 17 distinct stages of Joseph Campbell's monomyth. Now, in this case, it's a little bit confusing because what he's doing in this diagram is it's going this way, not the other way. But you have separation, initiation, and return. Those are the three phases of the spiritual growth process. And based on various esoteric materials that I'm in contact with, like the Law of One series that I refer to extensively in the new book, this is a galactic blueprint. This is something that everybody on every planet has to go through in the course of their spiritual evolution. There's a call to adventure. You refuse the call. You waffle back and forth. Supernatural aid comes to your help to get you inspired to do the quest. You then cross the first threshold. That's the moment that you are now committed to the journey. Then there is an experience called belly of the whale. That's the first major challenge that you face on your quest. You go through the road of trials where you're facing off against the minions of the nemesis, this enemy that really represents your ego. There's a meeting with the goddess, and this is one part that a lot of the myths have in which there is a projection of temptation, and that temptation in many cases forms one of the final challenges to draw you away from the quest. And, and the goddess actually turns out to be a character called the shapeshifter in a lot of these myths. The shapeshifter represents the feminine aspect that is at once both enticing, but then actually will turn on you and tear you apart. So every character and it could be a man or a woman, so it doesn't, this is not only for, it could be a man going through this or it could be a woman going through this, but there is a temptation in the story that must be rejected. This is, in the Jesus story, this is the temptation from the devil to get off the cross, and of course the Christ story, the story of Jesus is very, very much the archetype of the hero's journey. All the stages are there. So there's a temptation, and then through the temptation, we have uh, the atonement with the Father. In this case, he's got it in a different order, the apostasis. This is the transfiguration caused by the all is lost point, the moment of death. We have the ultimate boon. Now, that's a very important one. This is where the quest has been realized. The goal is achieved of whatever it is that you went on the adventure for in the first place. Something happens that gets you all excited and makes you want something more than anything else in the world. And it's only once you're able to drop your flaws. The flaws are what are holding you back. We'll see that in a minute. You go through this apostasis process, then you get the ultimate boon. And that's where you now have achieved the goal that your quest was meant for. There's another stage in the hero's journey where you refuse to return. You don't want to leave this paradise where you found this sacred mystery and come back to the world. But of course, the next stage is that you do choose to go back to help the planet. There's a magic flight where in some cases, not all myths, but some cases, you have to fight to get out of the magical kingdom. There's a resistance to getting out, a rescue from without. Sometimes the guides, the uh, supernatural aids and the mentors that you got over here now come to help you get out here. You cross through the threshold back into the physical world and once you come back to the physical world, you're now the master of both worlds, meaning you now have mastered the afterlife and the physical plane, 
and then freedom to live. You now are free from the fear of death, and this is living in the moment, neither anticipating the future nor uh, reliving the past. So, this pattern actually appears in Hollywood movies, and I mention this in the book, and then after I put it in the book, this came out on dig.com, had 7,008 digs, it was right on the top of the page. It says there's actually a formula for formulaic movies. If you've gone to the movies recently, you may feel a strangely familiar feeling. You've seen this movie before. This is not deja vu. Summer movies are often described as formulaic, but what few people know is that there is actually a formula. And it's all now being blamed on, in this particular article, Save the Cat by Blake Snyder which was one of about 17 books that I read when I was giving myself an education now that I'm working with Hollywood screenwriters like Jim Hart, who wrote the movie Contact. He's done movies with Francis Ford Coppola, with Steven Spielberg. And in order to be able to rub elbows with these guys and be able to talk in their language, I had to read this book and 16 others. And what you find out is that even though in this book it's very formulaic and he has a step-by-step -step process of how to write a script, every script is doing this. These ancient mythologies that I was speaking about did encode the hero's journey story. That is the blueprint of our soul's evolution. But they also encoded a very mysterious cycle in the earth called the precession of the equinoxes, which is believed to be a wobble in the earth's axis. Now, why would these two things be related? What possible reason could there be to combine this weird series of archetypes, these experiences that we all have, with this jiggle in the Earth's axis that's going in the opposite direction of the normal spin of the Earth. Well, that's the big mystery, and I first heard about the research of Santion and Von Duchenne from Graham Hancock in 1995. Here's two historians at the top of their game. This is after Joseph Campbell wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces. They go through an impressive list of historical evidence showing that, in fact, this precession of the equinoxes cycle was secretly embedded into ancient mythology, but in a way that the people who wrote the myths couldn't have known unless they knew about the precession. The book is called Hamlet's Mill, and what we see is that in many of these myths, the Earth's axis is represented by a tree, or in other myths, it's represented by a mill for grinding grain, and we're gonna see that in a minute. So the quote from Graham Hancock that started me on all this quest back in 1995 was when he said that for some inexplicable reason and at some unknown date, certain archaic myths from all over the world were co-opted, no other word will really do, to serve as vehicles for a body of complex technical data concerning the precession of the equinoxes. Now how did they do this? They use, in many cases, the metaphor in the myth of a mill for grinding grain. This is a technology that shows up all over the world, all about at the same time in history. Everybody suddenly learns how to do this. You grow your grains, you get them to full maturity, you dry them out. Once they're dry, you throw them inside this channel, and then you roll the millstone around, and what that does is it grinds it up. You've got to grind it again and again and again, and eventually it all turns into a nice powder, and then you can make bread and donuts and pastry, whatever you want, just with a little bit of leavening and some eggs. That's it. So this is a great technology to have, and um, the people obviously really loved the ability to make grain and make products out of grain. Nowadays in the raw food community, we're like, don't eat it, right? We don't want that stuff anymore, but back then it was really cool. They'd been eating raw food for thousands and thousands of years. Cooked food was really cool back then. <laughs> so, but what happens in the myth is that the hero a lot of times is actually just grinding this mill around but as he grinds the mill the quality of what's coming out keeps decreasing until at the end it's like barely even edible or not edible in this case we're seeing now that some of the mills would have an axle that goes clear up into the ceiling Therefore, you can start to see, okay, look, if you have a central pillar that doesn't move and the hero is going around and around in circles, that could be the Earth's axis. That's what one of the big epiphanies was that happens in Santhion and Vondashen's work. 
they show that these myths appear worldwide. You have Amlodi, the original Hamlet, as his name was an Icelandic legend, who is an elusive carrier of fate, and in, in many of these myths he dies, he yields when his mission is accomplished, and he six, sinks into concealment in the depths of time to which he belongs. He is the lord of the golden age, the once and future king. The golden age is a very important point because, in fact, these myths consistently tell us that at the end of this great cycle of 25,920 years, the earth is transformed and we move into some kind of golden age. Now, we see that these myths take the hero from Rome to Finland, Iran, and India. He appears in Polynesian island legends, and the imagery stands for an astronomical process as we move through the ages of the zodiac, each numbering, as it turns out, 2,160 years. That's going to be really important. So now bear in mind what's going on here. This is really important. The precession of the equinoxes has showed up in over 30 ancient myths in all these strange ways. At the end of the cycle, there's predicted to be floods and cataclysms. The Bible is only one example of this, and we're seeing that happen now. The encoding occurs in a variety of different ways across the myths. There's no one standardized way, but it's mathematical. It includes the numbers that you can use to build the cycles in the procession of the equinoxes. One of those basic cycles is an age of the zodiac. What is an age of the zodiac? If you take that precession of the equinoxes and you divide it up into 12 pieces, that's 2,160 years each, adding up to the master cycle of, of 25,920 years. So here they're saying this is a mathematical matrix, a world image that fits many levels, all kept in order by strict measure. So how do you get this mathematical matrix? Well, it seems that the gods gave it to us because all these ancient cultures are saying that human-looking people visited them and taught them this stuff. So maybe as time goes forward and as we get into a disclosure scenario and the government is no longer going to be hiding the truth or maybe they can't hide the truth because it becomes too obvious, we are now going to be looking at a reality in which Human extraterrestrials have been visiting Earth all along, and they had an agenda. They kept telling us about this hero's journey story, right? Every myth has the hero's journey. Every myth has the procession of the equinoxes mathematically hidden in it. Now, why would they do that? And what is this golden age? Well, as I show in the original book, The Source Field, the words that become age that golden age refers to, atos and seklos, are actually mistranslated. And the real translation is golden race. Isn't that something? The golden race actually refers to the transfiguration of human beings into some sort of light body. So it suggests that as we move through this 25,000 year cycle, that all these ancient mythologies, whether you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, way up there in Finland, the Alaskan Eskimos, India, South America, North America, Russian shamans that are throat singing, doesn't matter where you are, everybody got this. They all heard the same thing, and it always says there's a 25,000-year cycle. It guides you through the hero's journey because the hero's journey is written into the myth. At the end of the cycle, the hero's journey is literally fulfilled on Earth as we transform into a golden age. There is a transformation of what it means to be alive on earth right now. So I wrote this book with some very intriguing information in it. The book Synchronicity Key actually talks about the idea that there are cycles in history that are all subdivisions of that precession and that the events of history are repeating in very, very precise ways sometimes down to days apart, over gulfs of time that could be one quarter of an age of the zodiac, which normally would be 540 years, but for reasons we'll get into, you shorten it down by one year to 539. And that cycle was originally seen in the 1960s by two French guys, originally Michel Helmer and then Francois Masson. 
We're going to talk a lot about them because I've known about these cycles of history and that they were subdivisions of this precession since 1999. And it was only last year, finally, and the beginning of this year, in 2013, that I was able to actually finish writing a book about this stuff because it was so incredibly complicated, very interesting. And my conclusion is that the events in history themselves are guiding us through the hero's journey blueprint again and again on a global level until we figure out what's got to happen. Now, I published a prophecy on my website that said that, first of all, we do have a global adversary. This is a major part of the book, that there is an enemy out there, if you will. There is a villain that is scary as heck to people when they first find out about it. And that would be what I've been calling the cabal. Some people call it the Illuminati. Some people call it the New World Order. And the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the more you find out this is not a joke. There are some people out there who are very wicked, and they have been manipulating politics, government, finance for a very long time. So I put this dream out on my website saying that we were about to see some major changes. I called it uh, the storm of disclosure is about to hit. In that article, I describe a storm that I see coming in, and I have very little time to solve the mystery before it hits. It's a massive lightning storm sweeping in, and bolts of lightning are coming down all over the place, and I only have a very short time to figure out the mystery before the storm is going to land. I knew that this was about the defeat of the cabal. This is something I've been dreaming about for many years. I've been capturing my dreams every morning since September 1992, and I've seen many, many cases where they were accurate, prophetic dreams. So I use that as a system of prophesizing the future. Now, after this original dream that put, was put out in that article, I had another dream in which I'm in my driveway here at the house, and I run into a guy who's a radiant being wearing a robe, and he ends up taking me into a little office down there, halfway down the driveway, off to the side, shows me a computer, and says, David, all of the things that you've been wanting to see, the defeat of the cabal, disclosure, it's all getting ready to happen. It's all going to happen. And you're going to start to see it within a week by headlines that will appear all in red on the top of the Drudge Report. Those headlines will then lend way to much bigger stories that will come out within a six-week period. And as the six-week period reaches its conclusion, you're going to really have seen disclosure on a much bigger level than you ever thought possible before. Now, I talked about this dream on Evolve Palooza a week after I had it. It was a paid seminar that I did. Then, a little later, after I started to see the dream coming true, I put it online. So, this is what we saw on the front page of the Drudge Report the morning after I had the dream. And I'm like, wait a minute, you guys said it could be up to a week. The very next morning, I mean, I was just freaking out when I saw this. And so I took a picture of it, and I start photographing all the headlines just to keep up with this. Now, the first step of the process was finding out that the government was tapping the Associated Press's telephones. Most people said, oh, okay, well, we knew they were doing that. Not really. Now, this is going to threaten the press because the press requires the convenience of secrecy so that their insiders and their whistleblowers will want to speak to them. If they don't have whistleblowers, if the whistleblowers don't trust that they're going to be able to talk and not get in trouble, then they're not going to want to call anybody. So that's the very first thing that happens. This was the equivalent headline on the Huffington Post, Associated Mess. You can see the date up there is May 13th, Department of Justice snooping on the press. And as we go into May 14th, there's the drama. Now they're fighting about it. They're starting to talk about, okay, what's really going on here? And then on that exact same day, right as the prophecy is starting to come true that my dreams are talking about, we see this very strange event. Two bald eagles are fighting each other over an airport, which is in Duluth, which I forget what state that is. Minnesota, right. Minnesota. That's why it's good to have a studio audience, you see, if I was by myself. 
Duluth, yeah, I, I kind of remembered it was Minnesota, but okay. So these two bald eagles, the symbol of the United States of America, are fighting each other. They collide, their talons interlock, and they fall to the ground on the airport tarmac. This is what I call a synchronicity in real life. This is a synchronicity that's actually happening out there in the world. And doesn't it remind you of something? It sure as heck reminded me of the Illuminati symbol of the double-headed eagle. Deus Mjumkajus, that statement actually means God's justice is mine. Or we enact God's justice. So they feel like they are bringing forth our karma on a global level. The 33 actually represents the 33 degrees of the Masonic order. And the crown that you see up at the top symbolizes the awakening of the pineal gland, the activation of the crown chakra, which is their belief that through their religion, which happens to be Illuminism, that they will activate their pineal gland and become gods on earth. Uh, now, of course, this has become very contentious, but isn't it interesting that you have these two eagles fighting, their talons interlock, you can see one of the nails gets stuck under the skin there, they fall to the ground, they both get loaded into the back of a pickup truck. One of them escapes. You can see where that talon here has torn off. This same talon here, that piece of skin rips off, and that's how they were able to get apart. One of the bald eagles flies off, and the other one accepts nutrition from someone to help him. So I believe this is a symbol of the collapse of the Illuminati that's happening now. The secrecy infrastructure and it suggests that there are two factions of the New World Order, if you will, two factions of America, which you could liken maybe to the good guys or the alliance and the bad guys or the cabal, and they're colliding with each other. So this was a very powerful event that seems to be portentous of much more stuff that's going to happen. Then as we go up, uh, we're now seeing the New York Times is saying that this phone tapping threatens the fundamental press freedom Washington Post says the spying case shatters Obama's credibility. Fox piles on and says that all White House reporters are concerned by the aggression of the administration. Then we get this. Just when you, and it didn't even take six weeks. The dream made me think that this kind of stuff would take longer to happen. We get prism. This has changed everybody's life. My dream happened before this occurred. Drudge's headline did not have it in red, unfortunately, but it's still the big point here that all these different things, Hotmail, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, PalTalk, YouTube, Skype, AOL, Apple computers, they're all being monitored. Email, chats, videos, photos, stored data, voice over IP. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle once this knowledge comes out. You cannot go back to a society of people who thought that they were living in freedom and privacy. You can opt out of phone calls coming in on your phone soliciting you. You can't opt out of surveillance. Now we're finding out all this other stuff. There's street cameras that are photographing everybody's license plate. They know how fast you're going. They know where you're going. Everybody's under surveillance all the time. <laughs> now that is a kick in the crotch. Huh? That's low. George W. Obama, that, <laughs> that was the Huffington Post headline on June 7th. Now we're seeing U.S. is mining data from nine major tech firms, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook, Apple, Google, Skype, AOL, YouTube. The companies sort of deny it. The White House is saying, oh, well, only people outside the U.S. are being targeted. That turned out to be a lie. And now we find out that AT&T and Sprint are handing over their phone data, credit card providers too, 50 different U.S. companies. That's by June 7th. So it's all happened now within little over three weeks since I had that dream that said within six weeks you're going to see disclosure. Now this was the original story on The Guardian that broke that. That was on June 5th, Wednesday. And it goes on from there. Oh, it's nothing particularly new. Come on. It might not be new to you guys who are working in clandestine things, but to the average person, it was very new. This is very surprising, very scary. And this was another one of the big Drudge Report headlines that I was told I would be seeing. 
where they're sucking the data from 50 different companies. At the same time, and I believe this was not an accident, this disclosure occurs during the Bilderberg meeting. And now, one of the big stories on the front page of Dig was, is this the British Illuminati? And people are starting to look at it again. Then we have the anonymous group, which leaks a treasure trove of NSA documents. This is one of the things we still have to follow up on. Anonymous, I've been told, is actually the alliance, the U.S. military, leaking things for the betterment of humanity. What did the tech companies know about the NSA, and when did they know it? This is the kind of headline that everybody's asking. Watch the top U.S. intelligence officials, like the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, repeatedly denying that the NSA is spying on Americans, and yet they are. Alex Jones, who used to be laughed at by a lot of people unless they really get into this stuff, now people are saying, wait a minute, maybe he was telling us the truth. Maybe we got to look at this Bilderberg cult. And then Obama on June 7th, the same day headline, it's in red, there's a reason these programs are classified. Okay, well, a lot of people in the media are not welcoming the debate because the media seems to be doing everything it can do to try to not talk about this but it keeps on happening. The story keeps breaking out. Nobody is listening to your telephone calls? Mm, not really true. Then, of course, the whole game changes again on June the 9th, and the headlines go all red once more as Snowden reveals himself as the whistleblower who leaked this information. And once this happened, the media, a lot of the controlled opposition media now is blaming him for the problem and they're choosing to attack him rather than look at what's actually happening in our society. And here it was on Dig, the very top story, as you can see. And here's another Huffington Post headline, uh, the man who took on the NSA. This is June 10th now. And it keeps on going. He disappears, of course, when he was in Hong Kong. And he ends up in the Moscow airport, where he still is at the time of this taping, which is at the end of July, July 30th. So, safe for how long? And then this was the original headline on Drudge when he was first invited to come to Russia. Uh, same thing on Huffington Post. This is June the 11th, where he ended up actually going. Then this is the headline about James Clapper lying about surveillance. People are starting to figure out, hey, wait a minute, we're living in a surveillance society. We're in a surveillance state, June 16th. And now we're finding out that the U.S. is targeting its allies, that... These people that we're supposedly at peace with, not at war with, that we're actually listening to their phones. And then the Drudge Report calls it the snowstorm. Now we find out that the British are spying on their allies at the G20 summit. So this is getting worse and worse and worse because now it's becoming the subject of what could be a world war under a lot of cases where the U.S. is the opposition. And then, of course, the PRISM program is where this all comes from that they're reflecting all that data back into their own pipeline. All read on the Huffington Post, June 16th, a shock report that the Brits were spying on the G20 convention. And then this one, uh, Obama's A-OK -okay with the NSA. So once again, we're seeing that the headlines are getting very aggressive here. This is another kick in the balls, huh? <laughs> Meet the Taliban, and it's the U.S. flag. This was June 18th. Now the feds move in on him. They're trying to, uh, they actually pull down a plane that they think he's on, even though it's got the head of a major country in South America on the plane. They seized the plane anyway. And then this is the moment when he actually landed in Moscow. I had already been saying on my website before this happened, and it was in those previous articles, that in fact this alliance that's trying to bring down the cabal is centered in Russia. So there he is. He ends up in Russia after uh, he has sought asylum in Ecuador. Um, he never actually made it to Ecuador. Then we're starting to see articles saying U.S. surveillance is not being aimed at terrorists, is being aimed at the American people. And then we have Michael Hastings, who is a heroic journalist who dies in a weird car crash and this led to me hearing from insiders and leaking that since 2008, any car on the road can be remote controlled and hacked and they can drive your car. It's a law since 2008, secret law, 
that every car on the American highways has to be remote controllable by whomever on the inside wants to do this. So hours before he dies in a high-speed collision and his friends are saying there's no way that this is an accident, he sends out a worried email in which he's paranoid and panicking about the story that he was going to do, saying that the FBI seems to be watching him and he was very concerned. As our timeline moves forward, he, uh, Snowden is now being held in Russia at the airport. We see political art coming out. Yes, we scan. <laughs> and we're finding out again that the NSA is on, spying on the European Union, their offices and networks. It's just getting worse and worse. They're spying in Germany, and the Germ Germans are furious, saying this is like the Cold War. Nationwide protests against spying start to be organized. They haven't really taken off yet at this time, but people are already trying to do that. Then another development is how we see the way PRISM is working. All of your data is being saved. No matter what data you create, they're getting everything. And this is the diagram of how that's being done. And one of the things that was very classified that comes out is Trapwire, which is the, one of the software programs they're using to capture all this data. Now, a very suspect plane crash then happens, again causing headlines all in red on July 7th, which is just right around that six-week period that my dream had given me. The six-week period ended right around July 4th, July 5th. So this is a couple days off. We get a huge plane crash. First time there's been a plane crash in many years in the U.S. Nobody actually died, but the pilot reported seeing a flash of bright light in the cockpit. And one of the people who was going to be on this flight was the chief operations officer for Facebook. So there's a political component to the death. Now, it is possible that this was airplane sabotage in a desperate effort to try to throw off the story and get us thinking about something else besides this uh, surveillance scandal and to remind us, hey, we can take out a whole bunch of people if we want to. Well, most people did not die in this crash. Now, this actually becomes, again, the red, remember my dream was saying disclosure, top headlines. This becomes the most popular story on Huffington Post on July the 8th, which is still right within that six-week window I was given, the Roswell crash, the anniversary of the Roswell crash, 66 years ago today. So this is showing people are ready for the truth. They're starting to ask the questions that need to be asked. What do we know about? When did we know it? Then, within that same little window of time, the rabbit hole gets even deeper. We find out that Obama is ordering the federal employees to spy on each other, to watch the lifestyles, attitudes, and behaviors, odd working hours, unexplained traveling, monitor their stress, their divorces, their financial problems, track their activities online, and if they don't report what they see, they face penalties and criminal charges. So this is, you see how deep this is going. Then another NSA slide comes out where we find out after the media and the government has made all these denials that even if you debunk PRISM, which they haven't been able to do, there's another system called Upstream where they're capturing the data on the fiber cables as it flows past, and they're telling their NSA agents that both of these systems should be used. So then that shows up on Drudge as this same day that they're tapping the cables directly. We find out that Microsoft has been gladly working with the NSA the whole time. That's why your Windows updates, you have to keep downloading those updates, but then you gotta download another one, another one, because they keep opening up holes in Windows and then they close them up, open them up, close them up back and forth. And then another very significant headline in red on Drudge Report is that Big Sis, i.e. the head of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, suddenly resigns. The media hardly says anything about this. It just, phew, the story just disappears. Why is she resigning? What is she worried about? What is going to happen? Something is coming. Something bigger is coming. And then we see more headlines about Snowden wanting to stay in Russia now. This brings us to July 12th. And then we see this Fairview, which is one of the upstream programs, is NSA's plan to own the internet. And we're seeing Rupert Murdoch, another headline in red on Drudge, could face charges in the US. He's the head of Fox News. Things are getting more and more interesting here. There's the, the story on the Telegraph in the UK. And then we find out 
just two days after I write about the idea that your automobile can be hacked and driven remotely, this becomes the top story on Huffington Post. Millions of innocent drivers are being tracked by the surveillance cameras all around the world. Even these little guys on the cop cars are tracking everybody's license plate, following you, seeing where you're going. And we now find out that the NSA goes three levels deep. So if you're suspected of terrorism, they can spy on your friends and your friends' friends, and it goes down from there. And everybody on the internet is only 4.3 degrees of separation apart, so it pretty much catches everybody. Now this really, really fascinated me. This happens on July the 18th. Jimmy Carter comes out and says, America has no functioning democracy. It's an incredible statement to make, very provocative, because he is by far the most senior ranking politician yet to say that this activity is bad, that it should be stopped, and that it has destroyed democracy in America. Now, what trips me out so much about this is that by the time this came out, I already had the advanced copy of the book in my hands in which I said that Jimmy Carter is the reincarnation of a historical figure in the Roman Empire and that they've been doing the same things exactly 2,160 years apart. It's like the same cycle is turning and the same sequence of events occurs, occurs across 2,160 years. There's two chapters in this book, which I finished, and we have a box down there from FedEx where we mailed the manuscript to me at the end of the middle of May just to prove that I did not write this later because what I saw in the cycles was that the cabal, the people that are doing the surveillance, would be defeated and that Jimmy Carter was going to be very centrally involved in that happening. And I did not want to talk about this until as late as I possibly could because if the people who understand these cycles realize how important he was, they'd probably have taken him out. But he's out there and he's already delivered the kill shot here, a major politician saying U.S. has no functioning democracy. Also, during this window of time, people were going to see Iron Man 3 in the movie theater. Now, Iron Man 3 is a movie in which one of the main subplots is that there is a terrorist who appears to be like Bin Laden, played by Ben Kingsley, great actor, and you find out when Iron Man breaks into his compound that he is a paid actor, and he's drunk. He doesn't even have the accent that he does on television. All he wants to do is drink beer and womanize, and then at the end of the movie, you find out that the vice president of the United States of America hired this guy who's just like Bin Laden to commit terror against the U.S. And that's in Iron Man 3, which has now grossed $1.2 billion, over $400 million domestic and over $800 million international. That, to me, is the alliance telegraphing that they are going to make a move, and I speculate in the book, though I have no proof, and I want to make that very clear, but I speculate that Jimmy Carter has been working with the alliance the whole time because of who he is and what he did in Roman history, which we're going to talk about. So this really blew my mind, and during the same window of time, we see another political event. This was June 26th, where Australia's female prime minister, Julia Gillard, or Gillard, I'm not sure how you pronounce that because I've only seen her name in writing. I haven't heard it pronounced. But she was ousted, and then the guy who was president before her, or prime minister before her, gets back in power. So this is showing the kind of shakeups that are going on here. And she's touting it to sexism. My guess is that she was ousted because the alliance is really scared and they don't want somebody in power at the Australian prime minister level who could help to bring them down. And Australia, of course, is one of the major English-speaking countries in the world. So, of course, what we now find out is that the NSA is the only part of government that actually listens. <laughs> now, for you folks at home, we're going we're gonna to be right back. I'm going to take a little break here because we're starting to get cold in the room. So we'll take a little break and then uh, close the windows up, get a little warmer in here, and then we'll continue. <laughs> 